Primary assessment is in crisis. The SATs tests are almost universally condemned by teachers, but some of the alternatives are equally unpopular. So where next for primary assessment? Hello and welcome to The Big Debate. We've brought together an audience of school staff, parents and academics to try to come to some agreement about how primary pupils should be assessed. Each of our panel members will represent a different method of assessment and face tough questions from our audience. So, to the panel, please introduce yourselves. My name is Dylan William, I'm Professor of Educational Assessment and I'm going to be arguing that some form of external assessment, some kind of test, is important for our students, for our schools and for our economy. I'm Warwick Mansell, um, author of Education by Numbers, The Tyranny of Testing. Uh, I'm going to be speaking up for a greater role for teacher assessment in, in the classroom in terms of the, how you assess children. I'm Sue Horner, until recently Director of Curriculum at QCDA, and uh, I'll be wanting to remind people that assessing pupils' progress is about the good links between assessment and curriculum and how it can help children progress through the curriculum rather than just at the end of a key stage. I'm Tim Oates. I'm Director of Research at Cambridge Assessment, which is part of Cambridge University. And I'm going to argue that a national monitoring survey is the most effective way of measuring national standards, superior to what we do currently. OK, thank you. Well, our four panel members will be facing questions from our audience here who will also be voting on which method of assessment they think is being argued for most effectively during the debate. And here's how it works. You saw it during the televised leaders' debates. Now the worm is back, and we're using it to put primary assessment to the test. In the same way that a specially selected group of floating voters used handsets to rate the performance of the three-party leaders, our audience of school staff, parents and education experts will vote on how they think the debate is going. They will press buttons from one to five to show whether they dislike or like the response of the panel member who's speaking at the time. The worm won't be visible to the audience as it could affect their voting choices, so watching over it will be the Times Education Supplement's opinion editor, Michael Shaw. I think certainly SATS is one way where, which risks having the, the biggest adverse reaction. Uh, particularly if there's any suggestion that there's something inherently strong about the league tables themselves. Actually, any mention of league tables, I'm sure we'll see the, the worm dipping. Um, as for teacher assessment, with an audience of teachers, um, if it can be stressed that this is something that will show that schools are trusting them rather than being something that adds to their workloads, that may prove very, very popular. We'll also ask the audience to vote for their favourite form of assessment at the beginning and end of the programme to see if we can come to any agreement about the best way to assess primary school children. So, to get an idea of how our audience feels before we start, I'm going to ask them to vote. So, press 1 if you want to see some form of the existing system, the SATs. Press 2 if you think teacher assessment backed by Ofsted inspections is the way forward. Press 3 for assessing pupils' progress, or APP. And press 4 for national monitoring, also known as sample testing. And press your buttons now. So, the TES opinion editor, Michael Shaw, is here uh, going through our, our voting results. Um, what have we got? Uh, well, so far, national monitoring has come out right on top, which is uh, certainly a, a surprise for me. Uh, I was expecting teacher assessments to do a bit better, but then the mention of Ofsted might have uh, certainly turned some teachers off to that. And SATs very firmly at the bottom. The existing system, deeply unpopular. Yes, and assess assessing people, people progress in, the, in third place. OK, well, let's start by seeing if we can agree on what assessment is for. The recent SATS boycott has shown that many teachers are not happy with externally marked tests. But what is it about them that they don't like? Dylan William, you're defending some form of external testing. Why? Well, the evidence is that some form of, of external testing raises academic standards. Evidence from the United States and from other countries show that when you have some form of external assessment, you get higher student achievement. And higher student achievement is going to be very important for our future economic prosperity. What I don't want to do is defend the existing SATS regime because there's no doubt that what the current tests have done is narrow the curriculum, 
not only do we not assess anything other than English and maths, but we only assess very narrow aspects of those. So the current system has got to change. But the basic idea, external tests drive standards. Absolutely. Uh, Warwick, I mean, you, you take a very different view. Can you explain why? Well, yes. I mean, I uh, wrote a book on the problems with the current system in terms of um, just stacks and stacks of evidence about the, the washback effect from using tests of the current form to, to hold schools to account and, and the fact that the most well-known effects, I suppose, are narrowing the, of the curriculum, you know, and months and months of test preparation, which it didn't seem to me was, was in pupils' interest. So I think you have to, you have to get away from that. And... Um, probably the most important thing to do at the start is to look at the actual purposes uh, to which uh, any assessment system will be put. Um, and I don't think many people who've been looking at this argument in detail would disagree with the fact that they're being put to far... The test results at the moment are being put to far too many purposes. Um, so you, you, try, you need to try and disentangle that. And if you, you basically, if you can try and separate, out, separate um, assessment for helping the pupil within the classroom informally to make progress from the accountability system which is whereby parents and teachers get um, parents and, and uh, outsiders get information on how a school is doing then that I think that is the way to go and and my favored method is is having teacher teacher assessment as the dominant form of assessment within the classroom but what, why do you believe uh, D Dylan is wrong when he says uh, external tests drive up standards I mean, who's got the evidence I mean, behind them? You I would need him. to see. You would need to see. To be fair, I would need to see exactly how Dylan's model would work. But I would have huge reservations about any system which tries to hang accountability in uh, any kind of test. As uh, sorry, it, where the system has to revolve around around just a few statistical indicators based on. Uh, on, on tests, and I think that the danger is always that you get very stilted learning, you get a, a narrowing of the curriculum, and that too much rests on, on those single indicators. Sue, let's come to you with, with the system of APP, which the government has been trialling, assessing pupils' progress. I mean, wh what is it for? Why do you believe it works? Well, it works partly because it's not statutory and it was never intended to be statutory. And it was intended to be based on real work done in the classroom over time and to help children, rec children learn and be recognised as learning. And that, therefore, the, a broad curriculum is the, the seedbed for lots and lots of different kinds of evidence. What you then have is an issue which I haven't... Warwick needs to talk about, which is how teacher assessment then can be made related to national expectations and be made to raise standards. And I think that's the nub of the issue about whether you have testing or whether you have a broader set of assessments. Oh, and so where do you actually stand on external tests? Um, I think that external tests as a part of a system which can confirm or help make judgments is a possibility, um, but at the moment, the dominance of the accountability uh, regime, as opposed to focusing on the original as a purpose of assessment, which was individual pupils' progress, makes us into uh, makes us a problem. Okay, let, let's go to Tim Oates. I mean, wh why do you believe that national monitoring gives you a better picture? Well, I'm going to answer your first question, which is, what's the purpose of assessment? I mean, we've laid down, as part of the exploration of the role of a national monitoring survey, what the purposes of national assessment should be. And, by the way, we have to differentiate school assessment, national assessment in the course of people's learning as they progress through school, from qualifications which are necessary at the end of school or as people enter the labour market. In terms of the purposes of assessment, we see them as th those purposes are threefold. Formative, Supportive of learning, first function. Section, second function, to provide accountability of schools. It is important that some form of accountability of, uh, for schools is actually present in the system. And thirdly, to actually provide evidence on the trajectory of national standards. Those are the three purposes of assessment. And we believe that a monitoring survey can play a role as one mechanism alongside others to provide those three functions. OK, let, let me bring in the audience. I mean, what, what do you think of what you're hearing so far, and, wh and wh where are you leaning? Who'd like to come in? 
Yes, the lady in the red jacket. Um, I'm, I'm actually in favour of external testing in some form at the end of Key Stage 2 as a parent and a parent governor because I do think there needs to be some um, external measure. Um, however, as someone in charge of learning and teaching in a secondary school, I've seen the impact of the removal of the Key Stage 3 tests on the freedom of learning and teaching, the freedom of the curriculum and the freedom of teachers to ensure that um, what goes on in the classroom is a richer experience for students. And what I'd like to ask, um, starting maybe with Dylan William, is how would you um, envisage we ensure deep, le deep learning goes on in Year 6 while still having that external measure so I know how my son is doing and how my local primary school has done according, uh, against national standards? Dylan? The important thing is that we have constructive alignment between the tests and what we're trying to do in schools. We have to have tests worth teaching to. And the currently, we don't have that. There's an incentive for every Year 6 teacher to teach only those narrow issues in the tests. And so what I would do is actually have a combination of what Tim is arguing and what I'm arguing for teacher assessment with, with Warwick. I would have every kid in the class may be taking a different kind of test, a different task, so that the teacher can't know who's going to be tested on what. So the only way for the teacher to teach to the test is to teach every student everything, which actually is exactly what we want. Warwick, I mean, th this is, the, this is the, 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 the fundamental problem with SATs, as, you know, as, as many people see it. How do you get round it? Um, well, I was, I was going to answer your, your question. Wait, you, were, you were talking about um, that you still need some kind of testing system at the end, end of Year 6. I would actually say, and you know, a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't agree with me. But I think we're I think we're slightly hung up about statistical measures at the end of year six and having a, one measure that you can compare everybody with, because I don't think it, the system currently it doesn't do that very well, and I'm not sure that any system could actually do that very well. I mean, the the, the information that you're supposed to read into these this this test data at the end of year six is which are the good schools and which are the bad schools, but actually it's not doing that at all. And the danger is that you, you've got this kind of simplistic ca comparison going on that's, that's hinging on a few figures, and I just don't... I think it's overrated. And, you know, I would say you definitely need accountability, uh, but to do that through, through inspections, which can give a rounded um, view on it. OK, so. who, are, who are the teachers in the audience, the primary teachers here? Put your hands up. I want to bring some of you in on what... The, this fundamental question of what is the assessment for? <coughs> Put your hands up again, let me bring you in. Lady in the back there in the, uh, in the, in the lilac. Um, well, I mean, I think assessment is something that the teacher knows best. The teacher is there in a primary school with their class all day, all week, all year, and therefore they're the person who actually knows the child best. But what is it for? Um, the, it's to actually make sure you know what to teach them next. And I think that's what the outside tests don't do. If you're teaching to a test, you're not actually saying, right, this child... I need to do this next. And that's what assessment should be. And assessment should be pretty continual. And that's something that we are professional in doing. And I agree with Warwick. I think that actually it should be the GCSEs. It should be the exams taken in secondary school. They are the end of all our teaching and all the children's learning. OK, Dylan, just answer that. Well, the evidence that we have is that teachers don't know best. The evidence is that teachers do not apply consistent standards from school to school without very expensive <coughs> moderation. Now, what I'm saying is that we need some kind of external reference, but you can't collect all the information you need in an hour. So what I'm suggesting is a combination of teachers' assessment collected over the whole key stage, but which is then moderated across schools by the use of some kind of external instrument. The thing you have to do is to prevent that being something that you can coach kids for. So you, so you have to balance this very, very difficult tension between allowing teachers to teach and to use information, what they've learnt over the whole two or three years about this student, you have to use that information, but you have to also bring the judgment of different teachers at different ends of the country into line. Okay. And that's what the role of the external assessment well, is well, for. Well, let's get into the combination of, of, of systems that might work in, in a moment, but I just want to put that sort of pretty provocative statement back to the teachers in, in the room that teachers don't know best. Who, who are the other teachers in the room? Um, Yes, gentleman on the end here. You don't know best. Uh, no, I certainly don't. I can. Um, <laughs> sorry, as a, I work in a secondary school which has 55 or thereabout feeder primaries, and I can assure you from the from the outcomes we have of children coming in, particularly from teacher assessment, that at the risk of being controversial, there is a great deal of inconsistency across them, and you will also get inconsistency across the board where you've got new staff coming in, you have different. Um, people with different expectations and different experience of the system. And so I think that is a problem. I think there's even inconsistency. I could almost look at some of the kids that come in and see whose who's pap SATS papers have been marked by different people, because there's inconsistency in that current system as well. Yeah. OK, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and and quite, a, quite a few nods. Sue? 
uh, and I think consistency is one of the, the underlying themes that we're talking about here, because I expect in your school you wouldn't necessarily see consistency of judgment either. But it's not just about from year six to year seven or whatever. And so I do think that part of it is the importance of embedding the expectations in in your head mm -hmm. as a teacher, right. of knowing them and not having, therefore, a system imposed, but learning about those things so that it is a teacher's professional judgment, but it is supported by external uh, help and external checking. In all, and it could be a test, it could be moderation, but in order that teachers themselves can feel that their standards are endorsed. Right, but, Tim, I mean, in the real world, you know what's coming down the line. Uh, you know, big pressure on budgets, a government that wants to get rid of quangos, and what we seem to be talking about is adding to the complexity of the assessments framework. Is that is that realistic? Yeah, I mean, I want to just uh, add a bit of refinement to Dylan's point about you can't trust teachers. What the research shows very clearly is that teachers are good at placing children in rank order, but they're not very good at being consistent in relationship to judging all children against a common standard. In terms of the cuts, I think what I'd emphasise is that the system that we have in place at the moment is extremely complex. We don't just have APP on the horizon, we have the single level tests, we have existing national tests, and a national sampling survey is proposed on top of that. that that's the total model and the total bureaucratic load that schools face currently, and it's very substantial. And so where, 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 where should it be cut or integrated more or, or what? Well, we have to go back to the purposes. And uh, we've, I think we've clarified what the three purposes are, but it would be good to debate those. If you want to deliver those three purposes, there are actually different constellations of different mechanisms you can use for that. And we think that you should combine teacher assessment with a degree of externality, and, to make sh and you have to make sure that inspection is integrated into that. It's not about cobbling a load of disparate things together that have come from different places and different departments. It's about considering a carefully constructed, integrated model. How big would your samples be? I mean, how, how many children would actually get tested? We've tried this in the past and in this country, and it was relatively successful. It had its problems. It's used in other countries. And you, you can basically get a fix on national standards, not fix national standards, but get a fix on them, through, through sampling about 10% of schools. One of the things about Dylan's model, which I find very, very attractive, is you increase the amount of sampling, but you make sure you cover the entire curriculum. Uh, but you do it in such a way that teachers are incentivised, in order to optimise performance, they're incentivised to teach a broad and balanced curriculum, the whole of the curriculum. Um, Dylan, can I just get to this sort of... This, this sort of point that seems to be between you? Do you believe that all children should be assessed or not? Or, you know... Or, you know, or, should, or, should, or is 10% enough? I believe that all children should be assessed, but not on the same basis. My aim is that different children in the same class would be assessed for different things. That would then give an envelope of scores, so you might find out that in this class, based on this national reference instrument, you've got five level threes, 20 level fours, and five level fives, and then it'd be up to the teacher to decide which students got those levels by using their teacher assessment. So they would be relying on all the information they collected over the, over the year, but this external so, reference instrument would benchmark it to make it comparable from school to so, school. So the child who has English as a second language maybe wouldn't get assessed on English? They might not. They, they might get assessed on English. They might get assessed on a piece of teamwork, because what I see these tasks doing is actually being much broader than our current tests. So one would be a test of collaborative problem solving, so that all the things that we think are important would be in the teacher's interest to teach. Or yeah, I mean, I think, I, think there's, I think there's a lot of merit in that, actually. I, and I think the key thing is, is trying to separate the, um, if you like, the incentive for a teacher to teach very closely to a particular test. You've got to try and get away from that, I think. And, you know, some people would argue that actually teaching to a, a set of narrow tests is good because we want, we've got narrow priorities as a country in terms of we want kids doing English and maths well. And therefore, if you teach to that test, then that's fine. But I don't think it is. And I think if you... I think... Dylan and I would agree that if you, get a, if you try and get away from that, you can perhaps use testing as, as an element of a, of a teacher assessment system, but, um, but you have to try and decouple these purposes for which account it's, it's been put. Let, let me bring in the people in the audience again. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's sounding pretty complex to me, this, this picture that they're painting. The lady in the front row, how do you feel about it? I think I'm just a little concerned about the fact that we're talking about we should assess them in every subject area. The last time I looked in my school, 
We do assess them across every subject area. There's ongoing assessment we need to know at any given moment in time where any child is in every subject area. What we're actually talking about is the reporting of assessment in literacy, numeracy, science, etc. I'm getting confused here because I think this is actually relating to SATs and the league tables, which is what this is all about, in assessment terms, in a good primary school, you know where every child is at any given moment in time across every subject. So I think, you know, we're getting a little confused here. Well, I, I work with teachers every week working on how they can make better use of the information they collect from their students to adjust their teaching to better meet student learning needs. That's absolutely crucial for improving academic standards. What we're talking about is the damage that has been done to that kind of process by the outcome measure. And the, the big lie about the, the, the tests we have in place at the moment is they don't do any of the jobs that they were designed to do well. We pretend that this is useful to parents, but actually the child will have left the school before the parent discovers what the level is. It's a complete lie about telling parents which schools are the good schools because, as Warwick's book uh, has shown very clearly, this actually measures socioeconomic status far more accurately than it measures student achievement. It's not a good measure of the school. OK, so, let, let's pause there for a second because coming up after the break, find out what our audience thinks of the arguments we've all heard so far as we take a closer look at the worm and we see if there's any consensus on what's best for primary assessment in our final vote. Welcome back to The Big Debate. Schools across the country boycotted this year's SATs, though many who are opposed to them actually went ahead anyway because they thought it was unfair to pupils who had worked hard for the tests. But what is it that makes teachers hate them and politicians apparently love them? Helen Casey has been finding out. National curriculum tests were introduced in the early 90s and were designed to work alongside the then Conservative government's new national curriculum. Originally, they were practical tests, known as standard assessment tasks. The then Education Secretary, Ken Clark, quickly changed them to written exams, but the SATS acronym stuck. The aim was to set standards for pupils throughout their education and to increase the public accountability of schools. But many teachers have long been critical of the way the results are used. National League tables published by the press are criticised for placing too much emphasis on the written assignments. Some say this means too many schools are teaching to the test and therefore narrowing the curriculum. Ahead of the general election, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats both said they would keep the SATs but refine them. Since the coalition government was confirmed, the new Education Secretary, Michael Gove, has said he will radically reform the exam system and give schools greater freedom over the curriculum. But what will this mean for SATs? So if we're looking at fundamentally keeping a testing regime, whether it's SATs or something similar, how do you improve it? How do you make it effective? Let me bring in Judith Bennett from the National Governors Association. What's the problem? What's the answer? Well, at the moment, uh, we are using a system that is not robust in any way. It's flawed. The results can vary. Ch uh, children, uh, ch any one child can have a level uh, given to them that is as much as a level or eleven and a half, a level and a half out. Uh, from their true ability, so uh, you can't use that as a good judgment system. Um, there is the, the danger of teaching to the tests, and you can't really blame uh, teachers for doing that because it's such a high-stakes operation because it is linked to the league tables. And if we could decouple what went on in schools from league tables so that you're not judging schools by something that is completely erroneous and totally unhelpful, I think that would be a major step forward. Right, but what do parents want out of all of this? Because they want information, don't they? Uh, well, um... The government says that parents like league tables. Um, I have heard from a number of areas, including some research, um, that parents don't rate league table results very highly when they're looking for a, uh, a school for their children. They want a good local school. They want a school where the child will be happy. They want a school where they walk in and they feel the atmosphere. This is a positive place and a place where their child can flourish. They don't look at, oh, that one's at the top of the league tables. That's what I'll go for. Because too often, if you look at the league tables, as has been said earlier, this is a socio-economic judgment. Um, one of the general secretaries involved in the, the, the action last week has said that uh, league tables tell you where the rich kids live, and I think that that's right. 
Sue, how, how, if, you, if you are stuck with this system in some form or another, politically, how do you, how do you improve it? Well, I think one of the things that I would do is try to find other ways of reporting success in the curriculum. I'd find more measures that we could report so that we could report a more rounded school and not just the academic achievement one. So let's think about what's the outcome from the curriculum that we want besides literacy and numeracy. Let's think about how many children participate in clubs and, and sports and so on. Let's think about the broader success of the curriculum, how confident children are, their attitudes to learning. If we devise a system where we didn't then have to uh, change the tests or stop doing tests or whatever, because you could recognise a much more interesting set of uh, a school's achievements, including kind of how that people get on with each other and so on like that. And that's, after all, what we have in other systems, other parts of the public sector. You have a whole range of ways of trying to judge how schools, how they're doing. Who, who else has got a thought in terms of sort of improving the system? Yes, lady in the second row, yeah. I mean, agreeing with the point you've just made, I think that's one of the first times this evening we've actually heard about children's viewpoint on the SATs. And how, I mean, I teach year six and have done for a number of years. And the stress we're putting on those children year after year to achieve on one particular day mm. is outrageous. And the things that you were saying in terms of how do we measure their confidence and other things they enjoy from our school, I think definitely needs to be part of the bigger picture. Yeah. Anyone else on this subject? Yes, on the, in the back there. Yeah. I, only to say I, I, I'm slightly concerned about the fact that I think the reality is going to be, especially with the new government, are we going to be moving to uh, uh, Ofsted judgments that are actually narrowing rather than remaining broad as they currently are? My understanding is they're going to be perhaps four judgments all around sort of standards and attainment, perhaps a little bit about behaviour, but all those other things that we would uh, hold very dear are things that perhaps aren't going to be judged or important by Ofsted, and is that going to put us under even more pressure? What, Warwick, are the, are the politicians out of touch or in touch with what parents want? Well, I do. I'd like to um, kind of try to turn your question around, actually, because I think you started asking, you know, this is what's politically possible with the politicians and therefore, you know, what can we work around them? What astonishes me sometimes, this whole debate gets gets framed in terms of politicians' needs, and it doesn't actually start from the, you know, from the needs of the child. You know, I, I've just found, you know, so much research showing the damage that the current system is doing to child's, children's education. Why are we not starting from saying, OK, something's seriously wrong? It's, it's complicated. You, you can tell from here it's not... A solution is not simple, but we need to have a proper look and, you know, sure, but politi politicians that. aren't going to take away league tables, right, you know, in, in, in the near future, are they? They all seem to believe that that's what parents want. And, and, and they're trying to build a system that yeah. gives parents information with which to judge their schools. Well, my, my line on it would be, and, and I, I realise it, politically it is, it is difficult to envisage a time when league tables weren't here, but I, I would certainly say you need accountability, you need information for parents. And actually, I say you have to have that in some way. I would actually have it as a rounded inspection system whereby parents would be get, get lots of information about schools. Yes, lady in the front row. I'm interested that we think that parents want this information because if I was Scottish or Welsh, I wouldn't have this information and they don't seem to mind at all. You know, so that it's apparently English parents are desperately keen to know what their child has done. So it's just, it's just a misconception. So it is a misconception, I think, because when they abolished it in Wales and Scotland, nobody, nobody bothered. The big lie is that results tell you anything about the quality of information offered by that school. Choosing a school on the basis of exam results makes as much sense as going for brain surgery in your doctor's clinic because nobody's died there recently. It doesn't tell you how well your child is going to do. And, you know, that we've got to get rid of this idea that the raw achievement of kids who are unlike your kids five years ago is any measure of how well your kid will do at that school. Tim? Well, I think we've got to go back to fundamental principles in exactly the way Dylan and Warwick are advocating. Let's think about what kind of assessment is productive for children. We know that. Rich, textured feedback. Now, why would the kind of feedback that schools want, in terms of their performance, be any different? The key question is that we need, we need to address what kind of feedback schools would like in order to improve. Management can articulate that extremely clearly. You can then discuss what mechanism would provide that. That could come from a modified Ofsted regime, where inspectors are considered to be supportive commentators 
on the teaching which is actually going on in the classroom rather than coming into the institution pre-armed with data derived from national tests. Now, the idea of supportive commentators is drawing some laughs in the audience, I have to say. <laughs> of course, because it's so far from what the perception of the inspection service currently is. It was present in the inspection service a some time ago when HMI were considered to be subject experts on which the schools actually depended in terms of productive, rich feedback on the curriculum. But that was before we had all the last 20 years' worth, and I am afraid I think the cat's out the bag and we are not going to be able to stuff it back in again. So I think what we've got to do is start from now rather than think there was a wonderful system a long time ago. I don't agree with the idea that the cat's out of the bag. There was a colleague at QCA when I worked there prior to going to the university who said... I have now established national curriculum in the system so that it could never, ever be taken away. Well, it has been at Key Stage 3, and science has been removed at Key Stage 2. I'm with Warwick. We need to consider what a system would look like which deliver the fundamentals that we actually require. OK, well, it's time to take a look at how you have been voting. Let's go and speak to the Times Education Supplements opinion editor, Michael Shaw. Um, well, how have people responded to what they've been hearing? Uh, very positively throughout. It very rarely dipped into the bottom part of the graph. Um, the key peaks were usually when the speakers were talking about separating the league tables from the exams, the decoupling. Uh, so that proved very popular. Um, this bit in the middle, though, where we saw a, a, a dramatic drop, uh, that occurred where beforehand uh, Tim had been talking about the need for a broad and balanced curriculum, at which point it had shot right up. Uh, and then, unfortunately, Dylan had come on afterwards and began talking about the need to assess in a much wider way, a range of ways, including assessing people for group work. And clearly the audience didn't like that because it shot all the way down there. Uh, and you can see right towards the end it, uh, it picked back up when, uh, when Warwick began talking about remembering the needs of the child, something which uh, clearly the audience thought was left out in other parts of the debate. All right, well, Michael, thank you very much in indeed for that. Um, I I'm going to go back to the panel uh, in, a in a moment, but I, I want to return to our audience for some, for some final thoughts. And, and let me bring in uh, you, Brenda Bigland. Uh, you're a head teacher from Lent Rise primary school. Uh, do you find this debate frustrating? Yes, very. <laughs> Based on the fact that um, it does come back to this business of we've got so many people who are experts in the field of education who are constantly telling us what to do and how to do it. And I still passionately believe that we are the right ones to forge the way ahead. So what I would like to see with this new government is that they should invite people at the chalk face to say, actually, this is how to do it. And it is about assessing pupils across the breadth of the curriculum. It is about building, possibly, SATs into an assessment strategy which takes us from 4 to 11 and beyond. It is about us taking a lead and being recognised for what we can offer, rather than to have, forgive me, but researchers and goodness knows who else all coming in, and I'm not denigrating what you're doing, I'm just saying it's time for us to stop being done to and time for us to take a lead. Uh, Dylan, are, are, they, are they capable of doing it? I think teachers need a lot of support to apply consistent judgments. The evidence that, that we have... That'll be a no, will it? No, no. <laughs> the evidence that we have is that teachers do two things when they're in charge of their own assessment. One is that they actually apply inconsistent judgments from teacher to teacher. The other thing that's been absolutely consistent everywhere it's been studied is that in certain subjects, particularly maths and science, they tend to skate over the surface. So they tend to test children's ability with very narrow knowledge and not assessing the deep things that I want to assess. Now, I'm not saying our tests do that either, but if we, have, if we want children being able to function in a 21st century society, we need to get away from testing 19, 19th century skills and start testing 21st century skills to yes. make sure they're happening in the classrooms. When I work with teachers um, supporting them in, in moderating their judgments, I'm, I'm continually uh, surprised and delighted by, by what is actually uncovered. Um, and very often people actually d uh, don't, uh, don't realise they have, they have the knowledge that they, that they do. And I think what the test... We hear a lot about the, the impact on the curriculum. From, from the testing regime we have. I think what's happened in the last 20 years is actually the profession has been de-skilled yes. and actually what we need to do is re-skill and re-empower people. And I see the test as part of that because ultimately I would want every school to have internalised the standards so they didn't need these yes. external reference instruments. Yes. So it's actually a step towards that without the, the great expense of moderated teacher assessment in year one. Tim? Well, it's ex sorry, it's expensive. Well, okay. It's expensive, but it actually is, a, is an investment that's well worth it, m much more so than what we spend on, on the assessment regime that we, we have at the moment. We can't afford it right now. 
But I think you're also <laughs> talking about what has been, you know, because that's what we're looking at, the past. What we're actually saying is let's look at the good practice that's out here now and let's forge a new future. But critically, what we're hearing about the current system is a conflict or tension between learning and assessment. I mean, that's absurd. Assessment absurd. should support learning. Absolutely. And therefore, we need to consider arrangements which will do that. You talked about moderation. I mean, I come from an assessment agency which specialises in developing assessments. What's clear is that teachers need support in respect of moderation and standardisation. It's by those means that you get consistent judgement. We need support of assessment run effectively to yield certain knowledge about children's attainment. Warwick. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the whole system at the moment is kind of predicated on a lack of trust in the profession. Um, it doesn't really make sense unless it, that is the, uh, the assumption the behind it that politicians have that without this kind of detailed monitoring from Whitehall, uh, whereby they collect all the test data and then they put huge pressure on schools at the bottom of the league tables to improve or else, essentially, you know, that teachers are just going to fail their pupils. And um, I think that whole ideology, if you like, or the assumptions that lie behind that structure need to be looked at very carefully. Um, I mean, perhaps we could be a bit more optimistic when the Conservatives have said things like, we, we want to localise the system. Even ideas such as the, you know, the, the much-discussed Big Society programme of the Conservatives, I think, I think they should be taken seriously because behind that is this idea that you decentralise a bit and that, that perhaps is a more positive message for teachers. So, But I'm, I think it's, uh, there's a long way to go in terms of going back to a system where trust is rebuilt a bit. OK, well, before we take our final vote, <coughs> I'm going to ask our panellists to say a few words in support of their favoured method of assessment. And we'll begin with Dylan. There is no doubt that high-stakes accountability works to raise standards. The, the difficulty is getting fair accountability. Teachers don't mind accountability when they're accountable for how much their children learn. My estimates are that the net present value of, of maintaining a high-stakes accountability regime is about £1 trillion. If we allow teachers to be in charge of their own assessments, the evidence from international comparisons is that achievement will go down, and I think that will cost us a lot of money in the future. Warwick. Um, yeah, I think uh, assessment should be decoupled from accountability. We should uh, take uh, teach. We should use teacher assessment uh, in its in its proper form, really, which is supporting learning in the classroom, in a formative sense. A formative sense, because we have to have some kind of school by school accountability. There's no ideal way of doing it, but I would have inspectors going into schools and witching rounding judgments on schools instead of hanging everything on a few set of uh, a few a few test scores, basically. Sue. I think assessing pupils progress is intended to help teachers get inside the criteria and use them as they choose for their purposes but they are nevertheless linked to national standards and that's the way that when we did all the original research we showed that standards were raised when teachers really got a hold of the criteria and used them effectively across the curriculum on the real work that children do in classrooms. And finally Tim your final pitch. Well, I would just say that what we have in current arrangements, and indeed those things that are being considered as uh, things that we should take forward, are pretty much a machine that's been bolted together out of existing components. And it doesn't deliver well on the three objectives which we've out outlined, the three purposes of assessment. We do need to take time to consider what mechanisms should exist in balance. Survey, external testing, moderated teacher assessment, how those should be combined to deliver with precision on the three main objectives of assessment. Well, thank you. It's time again, then, to vote. So, as before, press button number one if you think that external testing should stay. Button two for teacher assessment, backed by Ofsted inspections. Button three for APP. And button four for Tim's national sampling. And please vote now. What's the result, Michael? Right, well, we've seen a, uh, a slight increase there in uh, sampling uh, and also in, in the SATs uh, and a slight decrease in those in favour of teacher assessment, but otherwise very similar to the start of the debate. Let's put in how people voted at the beginning and see them together. 
Right, well, the, the order is still the same with national sampling, the most popular option, um, but we've seen a slight increase in those in favour of using SATs and also those in favour of assessing pupil progress. OK, so, so not a huge amount of, uh, of, of people changing their minds, but, but may, may, maybe some on the margins from your relative arguments. Thank you all very much indeed. That's it for this big debate. My thanks to our panel, Professor Dylan William, Warwick Mansell, Dr Sue Horner and Tim Oates, and, of course, our audience here. If you want to continue the debate, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter. And don't forget, all the videos are available to watch on the website. That's teachers.tv. But from me and all the team here, goodbye.